In my prologue for this lecture, I want to focus on a person who branches and bridges all of the eras we've studied so far. Um, Bernard Baruch, who's born in South Carolina in 1870, is a Gilded Age figure in that he makes a fortune in the stock market, partners with a senator, John D. Rockefeller Jr., and others to become a very wealthy man. Um, he's involved in imperialism in that his uh, economic speculation in both sugar and rubber um, tie him to the U.S.'s uh, imperialistic ventures in the Caribbean. But he's also a progressive figure because in this lecture, he's going to be the manager of the U.S. economic mobilization for World War I. So we have this Gilded Age robber baronish figure involved in imperialism, but now also involved in the progressive movement as a leader for the U.S. during World War I. After the war, he's going to agree with President Wilson that there needs to be international cooperation to prevent future wars. And he's going to end the time period that we're looking at um, in this unit with um, a, a rather chilling um, assessment of the market crash that we now call the Great Depression. So why did I do this? Well, he's never going to show up on the AP exam. That's fine. But it's to remind you, we don't need to chop up history into little segments. People like this bridge across multiple time periods. Um, and so they're important in reminding us that history is connected, it flows. So let's take a look at the war that Bernard Baruch oversaw. That war began in Europe, as you learned last year, the assassination of an Archduke by a Serbian nationalist, Gavrilo Princip, um, led to a spark um, that caused Really, it's the alliance system that makes the most difference in the sense that the countries have each other's backs and when they're attacked, they come to each other's defense and it leads to a cascading series of commitments to be involved in the war effort. Um, I like on the next slide how the onion puts it. Austria declares war on Serbia, declares war on Germany, declares war on France, declares war on Turkey, declares war on Russia, declares war on Bulgaria, declares war on Britain. Ottoman Empire almost declares war on itself. So what's the U.S. doing? Neutrality. It's our typical approach to European conflicts. That belongs to Europe. That's not our business. So when war broke out in Europe in 1914, the U.S. remained neutral until 1917. For three years, we are neutral. Though we do sell things to Britain and France, and our ethnic ties complicate our neutrality since we are related, we are the descendants of Europeans. So as the U.S. is remaining neutral, watching Europe you know, blow itself up and shoot each other, uh, we're watching the spread of this conflict that eventually will bring us in as well. It's German U-boat warfare that ultimately drags the U.S. into this conflict. Um, the Germans um, increase their attacks, and by 1917, their attacks are unrestricted, meaning they're just going to shoot anything. Who cares? So the U.S. is going to mobilize after four American ships are shot down by these U-boats, these undersea boats. But also, you may have learned last year, it's the Zimmerman note or the Zimmerman telegram, where the U.S. learns that Germany and Mexico would form an alliance where Mexico would attack the U.S. and regain lands in America um, in, in a bid to sort of keep the Americans from helping uh, the war effort in Europe. So you probably learned that April 1917, the United States declared war. President Wilson said that it was a war to end all wars. How did that work out for President Wilson? And that it would be a world, a world war that would keep the world safe for democracy, that we would promote democracy around the planet. Both of those ideas will resonate for years and years to come. So neutrality is our story at the beginning. The Germans tip us over into war, and now we are in a conflict to end all wars and save democracy. 
Here's the uh, Zimmerman note, a telegram that the British intercepted and broke the code, and then of course sent us a copy. The Mexicans were thought to be interested in attacking the US because of poor relations with Mexico between President Wilson and uh, the Mexican government in Wilson's first term, uh, but it turned out not to be the case. War is declared by the US, as Wilson um, notes that the United States finally needs to jump in and do something. And now that we're in, we must mobilize. Mobilization means gathering the resources of the country together to fight. And the most important resource in a war is obviously soldiers. 4.8 million Americans will be called to fight, 350,000 of those African Americans. Ironic, isn't it? African Americans fighting for democracy around the world, but they don't have democracy in America. So apparently democracy doesn't really apply inside the United States because people like President Wilson are racists and supporters of Jim Crow. Wilson is a progressive, and it, it helps to think of the progressives as people who like to meddle, who like to orchestrate. They're almost like puppeteers. They want to use the law and science and um, the organization of the world through expertise to make things happen correctly, to happen the right way. So this is a managed war, a very much managed war, you're going to see that's managed in several ways. Um, it will be managed production-wise. Production It'll be managed in terms of money, managed in terms of labor, um, goods and resources for the war, as well as managed in terms of propaganda. So you can see the different ways the progressives manage this economy. Production will be watched over by the War Industries Board. Uh, Liberty Loans will raise um, money for the cost of the war. African Americans and women take jobs. Unions promise not to go on strike, need people to work. Americans were encouraged to ration goods. And a Committee on Public Information produced propaganda to reinforce patriotism. You will love this war. You will love America. So the CPI released all kinds of material designed to encourage Americans to stand behind the war effort. So that is mobilization. Mobilize soldiers, mobilize production, mobilize the money, mobilize workers, mobilize the, the use of goods, and mobilize our propaganda machine. Here we see uh, guys getting picked for the draft because this war did result in a draft of soldiers. Um, so you see the numbers are being picked out of a fishbowl. The war produced quite a bit of propaganda to encourage people to serve. So for example, this is the most famous of the propaganda posters. I want you for the US Army. You, um, Uncle Sam with his finger in your face. This, this has been used by many people in um, the 20th and 21st centuries for advertising all kinds of things. Um, even here at Bexley, um, we've had advertisements for clubs. I want you to join chess club. I even have a musical bit of propaganda for the war. Um, the musical bit of propaganda is the song over there. Um, this song uh, obviously was high energy to encourage people to fight, to sign up, to enlist and support the war effort. Um, so I'll sing it to avoid you know, tripping over copyright. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. 
Hear them calling you and me, every son of liberty. Hurry right away, no delay, go today. Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to pine, to be proud her boy's in line. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there. That the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums rum tumming everywhere. So prepare, say a prayer, send the word, send the word to beware. We'll be over, we're coming over, and we won't come back till it's over, over there. And the song keeps going and it will get in your head. You'll lay down tonight and can't get this out of your head. In the tiny back voice, over there, over there, over there. Americans were encouraged to save food, can vegetables, grow their own gardens. Can that Kaiser, the leader of Germany. Buy bonds and crush those Germans who want to take away freedom and liberty. And the song is back. Just couldn't do it. Couldn't do any more of that song. Um, Germans were also mocked and dehumanized in order to sell this propaganda for the war effort. Americans were encouraged to believe that volunteering for the war is manly. It's the right thing to do. Be a man. Join the war effort. Even women working in the war were proud to serve and to build um, the munitions, to build the ships, the things that their guys needed after the war, or sorry, during the war, um, in order to be successful over there. Over there, 
Send the word, send the word over there. Americans were also encouraged to be unified during the war effort in the idea that attacking um, Germany required all of Americans to work together. And so we need to be united as a people. The easiest way to unite a group of people is through a common enemy. So attacks on German citizens and German culture was supposed to encourage Americans to hate the Germans. Germans, nine, they're very bad. The idea of hating Germans translated into actual physical attacks on Germans. It led to the banning of the teaching of the German language, the ban of playing German music. Anything German was automatically bad. And in fact, associating Germans with beer helped support the prohibition movement. Because Germans are bad, Germans make beer through some weird transitive property, therefore beer is also bad. And so we get the 18th Amendment um, at the end of the war in 1919. Um, well, two years after the war. But it's built on and um, basically supported by this association that Germans are bad, beer is bad, so we need to ban alcohol. Women took this uh, challenge of unity and they pledged support for the war in return for President Wilson backing women's suffrage. So they performed a little bit of a, what's that vocabulary word you've learned? Oh yeah, quid pro quo. We'll scratch your back, President Wilson. You scratch our back. So um, Wilson did pledge support for women's suffrage. Um, he lent his voice to that movement and women said, we will support the war effort. Criticizing the war. Being critical of the war effort could get you in trouble during World War I. The Espionage and Sedition Acts, 1918, would punish critics of the war with both jail and hefty fines. Toward the end of the war in the 1919, socialists and labor organizers were actually deported out of the United States. So there's no free speech for them. They're seen as threats to the US. Their non-support of the war is dangerous. They're not American. Uh, one man uh, defended his freedom of speech and took his case to court, but the Supreme Court decided in the 1919 case of Shank v. the US that you do not have a full right to free speech in a time of war. The Supreme Court kind of compared it to the idea that in a time of danger, free speech may be limited because the danger means we need to come together um, and we need to suppress our need for free speech. So you can see the war leads to a strong push for unity through hatred of Germans, hatred of alcohol that's associated with Germans, women trading support for the war, as well as an actual taking away of the right to free speech uh, via the alien, or sorry, not the alien, oh, that's from another era, hmm, echoes of another era, via the Espionage and Sedition Acts. The hatred of Germans extended to the taking away of German words and German names. You can't have a hamburger anymore. It's got to be a Liberty steak. No sauerkraut. It's got to be Liberty cabbage. Places with German in their name changed it. Here in Columbus, we can't have Schiller Park in German Village. It needs to be something purely American because we don't like those Germans. If your name was Johann Schmidt, you probably became John Smith during the war. Just avoid getting beat up. Women fighting uh, in the war were limited, of course, to um, nursing roles, limited to uh, working in the factories, uh, working um, on the lines to raise money uh, through bonds and saving stamps. 
So both of these posters appealing to the spirit of the power of women so that uh, we can have all the women of America come together like Joan of Arc, like this woman with her very exciting drum. She really likes that drum. It's the spirit of woman power. And together they'll be able to save Americans from the threat imposed by German evilness. While the boys fight over there, over there, send the word, send the word. Women also uh, were fond of using President Wilson's words against him um, during the war effort because they noted that he frequently talked about democracy, yet that didn't apply to women in America. So they called him Kaiser Wilson. You know, have you forgotten that American women are not self-governed? Mm. This is a sick burn as they throw some very, very heavy shade at the president. Eventually, though, it does result in suffrage for women. The 19th Amendment of 1920. The end of the war is very likely to be something to show up on the AP exam. And the end of the war is essentially President Wilson promoting a new vision for the world. Not just for the world, though, but also for the U.S.'s involvement in it. His 14 points of this new vision called for the U.S. to be entangled in the world, which went, to went, went against everything the U.S. had been up to this point. Wilson's idea for a League of Nations is probably the most likely thing to be tested on the AP exam. Um, does not go over well in America. The United States Senate debated uh, the approval of it and eventually rejected Wilson's League. They said, no, our sign is no, name is no, you gotta let it go, Mr. Wilson. Um, we don't want your League. It will undermine congressional power to declare war. It will undermine the U.S.'s traditional focus on avoiding entanglements. Question, what president said we should avoid entanglements? Who was that? Hmm. If you were thinking George Washington behind me, you are correct. So Wilson promotes a 14 points, League of Nations vision, and it is rejected by the US Senate. So what does the US do? What's our position now? We return to what's called unilateralism. That's where the US goes it alone. We do our own thing, we focus on our own priorities, and we continue to act on our own in the world, which is mainly imperialist. So the U.S. returns to its traditional approach to foreign affairs. We do our thing. We don't want to be involved in the world except to trade. That's it. That's all we really care about. The fancy term for that, unilateralism, just means one-sided. You've probably heard of an equilateral triangle before, which means equal-sided. Therefore, lateral means side. Latus lateris in Latin. The treaty was so hated um, by the United States Senate, it received a pretty hostile response, as you can see from this cartoon. Wilson spent a lot of energy trying to convince uh, people to support it. In fact, he exhausted himself into a stroke over trying to get Americans to back this treaty, but he was not able at all, um, not able in the end to make a difference and the Senate voted no. So we're gonna say goodbye to Wilson's idealistic dream. The bubble will burst. No marriage to the world, no foreign entanglements, Sorry, Uncle Sam. No involvement in foreign wars. We're gonna stay to the old ways we do things and avoid entangling with the world. 
Have I said entanglement enough? Hopefully that sticks with you. And remember in the end, the US does not want to be involved. Over there, over there, we don't want to be involved over there. The post-war period is a particularly um, tumultuous time period. Why is it tumultuous? It's a war that has just happened. And Americans are tired of war. They're tired of progressives. They're tired of the life that they've been living since April of 1917 to, you know, um, 1918. It was really a short war compared to what the Europeans experienced. And so Americans end the war with this desire of, we don't want any more progressive management. We don't want any more involvement in world affairs. We just want to return to normal. Exacerbating that is, of course, race riots in the North. In 1919, Chicago is one of the worst. There are 3,000 strikes that break out as the economy is kind of shrinking back down to pre-war state. Socialism is a new scare thing that, um, thanks to the Russian Revolution, people are afraid the commies and the reds are going to take over America. And in fact, there are actually 36 bombs mailed in 1919, leading people to think, you know, the commies actually are bombing Americans. One of those bombs uh, exploded the front of Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer's house, so he went on a hunt for these bomb-making anarchists. Um, he didn't find any. But Americans were still scared nonetheless. A red scare gripped them. So think about this. They just had a war. The war is controlling of their lives. There's now race riots and strikes and socialists. Oh my, they just want a normal life. But they're not going to get it because in 1918, the flu pandemic, which has three waves between 1918 and 1920, will lead to the deaths of 675,000 Americans. Um, you might compare that to our current crisis with COVID. We're at 500,000 deaths in the United States. Um, the flu pandemic saw things that we would be familiar with. So people masked up. Um, they tried to limit gatherings. Schools actually shut. The Bexley schools shut down um, during this flu pandemic. Um, Bexley didn't have actually that many deaths overall. Um, it was a young family with, with uh, very young children that died in the flu pandemic here. Um, so we were overall pretty spared, but Bexley was also not very highly settled in 1918, not very dense settled. Um, less than, well, less than 2,000 people in Bexley as a whole at the time. The U.S. comparatively had it much better than the rest of the world where 50 million deaths obviously created a much bigger dent in the population change for the time period. This is a lot of change. People are dying, there are riots and strikes and socialists. Americans just want peace and quiet. And in the next lecture, we are going to take a look at what that sort of need for normal, quiet life does to Americans. Cartoon at the time period criticizing strikes. Race riots and lynchings you can see happened all over the United States. So not just southern places had race riots, northern places did as well. Strikes were tied to fear of communists. One of these cartoons here suggests that a strike and a walkout will lead to disorder, which lead to riots, which lead to Bolshevism or socialism, communism, which leads to murder, which leads to chaos, which leads to, <gasps> I don't know what. Um, this is an example of a logical fallacy you guys learned this year, where people assume that X automatically leads to Y or Z. You slide down a slippery slope. That's what this fallacy is. 
People were deeply concerned that socialists and communists were now a threat, which is interesting because we had a previous lecture that showed socialism was pretty popular in 1912, and now it's 1919, and socialism is dangerous. It's a threat. It is not acceptable anymore. And that's A. Mitchell Palmer and his exploded front of his house. Um, he didn't find many bomb-making anarchists. Uh, rounded up some people, we deported some people, and he found, I think, a three pistols, if I'm memory serves me correctly. So overall, it's kind of a bust for him and his fear-mongering uh, over the Reds among us. That's it for this lecture. I'll see you next time for the Roaring Twenties. Take care, scholars.